Good evening again. My name is Michael Ulrich, and I'm the director of NYU Washington, D.C. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Abramson Family Auditorium for tonight's event. Inside American Politics originated with NYU La Pietra Dialogues at the NYU Florence campus and as an annual discussion on U.S. politics. Now in partnership with NYU DC Dialogues and the NYU Bradamus Center, this series provides students of New York University with the opportunity to learn from practitioners in order to gain an insider's view of the American political system. Tonight's discussion will assess current political dynamics and the effect of domestic and international events on public opinion under the Trump administration. We are honored to welcome Jay Newton Small to moderate tonight's discussion. Jay is co-founder and chief executive officer at MemoryWell, an organization that uses the power of storytelling and media to improve dementia and Alzheimer's care. A long-serving Washington correspondent for Time Magazine and a journalist for Bloomberg News, Jay is also the author of Broad Influence, How Women Are Changing the Way America Works. Please join me in welcoming Jay newton Smith, which I'm sure will be an interesting, engaging, thoughtful discussion on politics in the US. I didn't realize it's my job to introduce my esteemed panelists. All right. So um, I'm going to start to my right uh, with Kiki um, and Steve, who I guess represent sort of the like right, the left side of things, even though they're on my right. Um, and <laughs> they're on your left, though. So. On your left, so that actually works out, right? Um, and I didn't actually study up in everyone's bios, although I kind of know everyone's bios. But uh, everyone obviously knows Steve because he teaches here and is head of Purple How about Strategies. A big round, right? <laughs> oh, wow. Boom. Um, and Kiki is a longtime Clinton veteran and just. Um, she, extraordinary politico and just has, knows everybody in Washington and I, mean, and I don't know what else to say. She's fabulous. Um, That's and, enough. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, to my left is nonpartisan Amy Stoddard because <laughs> I was I was going to say my right, but uh, the, my righties are to my right, but she's not a righty. She is nonpartisan. She is equally, as she told me when we were starting out, equally as anti-Trump as she is anti-Clinton. Yeah. Uh, yes, there we go. So, um, uh, but um, a columnist, obviously very famous, um, and uh, Ron Christie is, if you guys don't know him, he also teaches here, so you should know him. <laughs> and um, longtime Kasich, uh, uh, like whisper, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, that works. <laughs> and, and Republican strategist. And so I'm here tonight, and we're going to have a fabulous conversation about what's going on in Washington. So I wanted to start with um, what I thought today was so interesting uh, with the Tillerson, you know, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson um, got himself into a little bit of trouble with his boss, apparently um, saying there was, a, there was a story out from NBC saying that he had uh, thought about quitting last summer after the whole sort of fiasco with when Trump addressed the, the Boy Scouts of America and made all these inappropriate comments and everyone had to apologize. Um, <coughs> and he had to go on the record today to say that he was not, had never considered resigning, really loves the job, um, but did not noticeably deny reports that he had called the president a moron. Um, and so in the last, I think, four of the eight weeks, on a Friday afternoon, the president has fired somebody. And I have to say that um, I, it is, uh, I was surprised when Tom Price was fired last week because I thought for sure that Rex Tillerson or, or uh, Jeff Sessions, our esteemed attorney general, would actually go first, but apparently not. Um, so my question to both sides and to whomever wants to take it first is, who is next on your Trump firing bingo? Oh, <laughs> oh that's an interesting one. Hmm. No, Any no, takers? No, no, no. <laughs> you'll have, you'll have to call one of us. I'll have to call. So I'm going to start with you, since you said you have to call him. <laughs> I, I, I'll posit a, a theory. OK. And maybe don't have the name tied to it yet. But you do see these tied to what are significant initiatives that the president cares about, mm -hmm. right? Where there becomes a divergent point of view between the staff person who serves him and where he wants there to be success. So I begin to look at Treasury, because tax is up. Oh. Right? If you're looking for a pattern, although looking for a pattern this year, <laughs> a little difficult. <laughs> right? And I, do, I don't say that flipply. I mean, what's really interesting to me, and I don't say this with a partisan bone, but really with an analysis as a former staffer and as a communications person, somebody who spent their career doing communications, is what is amazing about this president is that both 
in a sense of what the business world expectations would normally be for behavior in corporate America and behavior in political and policy and governing America. He's changed the rules. And the only person who really knows what they are are him. And it's because he's in such fine tune, he's in such a fine tuned relationship with his supporters in a way that no one else is. It's actually, I'm paying him a compliment, right? And so the only thing that was traditional that's happened in these last Fridays is Tom Price, mm. right? And you might have expected Tom Price wouldn't pay a price for it because it was the Trump administration. Right. And to lose your cabinet job because you were flying around on fancy private jets yeah. might not have, that would have been a traditional expectation. And yet it did happen because it was a populist move, right? And so, so the only thing I can do to think and look and say, if there is a failure somewhere in this other element, then I would look for it to be someone attached so, to a big initiative. Interesting. So Kiki's right. We about, can stop there too. He's right about, <laughs> and we can give her a round of applause for being correct. But, but, the Treasury thing and the tax reform bill are going to take long enough to play out that there probably will be other departures prior to before that. Fair enough. Prior to Mnuchin or who I call Munchkin getting whacked, <laughs> and and I think there's a decent chance that Ryan Zinke, who's the Interior Secretary, who's under investigation by the Inspector General's office for the very same things so that for drove the same price reason. out. Yes. And, and um, those kinds of things, I believe, drive Trump crazy because it drives his base crazy, and, it, and it's sort of anathema to everything that he stands for, at least the, in terms of what he wants to project in terms of his anti-elitism. So I think Zinke is vulnerable, and maybe not in the headlines right now, but, but could easily have the same problem. I just want to push back on Kiki for a second. Mnuchin is such a surprising choice for me, only because he, there is no one more loyal when on, on every Sunday show that guy well, is out there. It doesn't have to be him. It could be someone associated or mm -hmm. in that, right? Yeah. Could be you could have a Gary, like Gary Cohen, Cohen is more likely, but, but, right? Here, but here's a question I would I would offer to Ron and AB and to you is is it a is it a firing if a family member leaves? Yeah, and that's the other thing. That was my next question: yeah. is are Ivanka and Jared? <clears throat> Sadly, of course, now they bring it up, and that's actually where I was going to go with this. Because I, if you look at where the Trump administration has had their big failures thus far, they weren't able to get health care passed like they had envisioned. Who were the people who were really involved in an intimate basis with negotiations? The son-in-law and the daughter. And a lot of the pushback that I hear from people on Capitol Hill is, you have Jared Kushner coming up to the Hill. He's never worked on the Hill before, has no legislative experience. And he's talking to senators and members of Congress, presuming that he knows more about the process than they do, and they resent it. <clears throat> and this president, he's a winner. He wants to win. It's got to be huge. And I just wonder whether or not having his daughter and his son-in-law in such prominent positions of power that he comes to recognize that they're getting it done. And I, I would posit, Jay, on the other side, the one that everyone would think that would have been fired, who I don't believe will in the short term, is Jeff Sessions. Mm -mm. Sessions is really, really beloved by his Republican colleagues in the Senate. And I've heard from more than one senator tell me, McConnell has made it very clear to the president, if you get rid of him, we're not going to confirm another attorney general. So go ahead, fire him at your own peril, but we're not going to replace him. So he's got a shield. He's got a shield. Mm -hmm. A little force field. Wow. Well, I Maybe. think that the, um, I think that Steve is right on the Ryan Zinke f f thing. One of the most interesting things that, that that happened last Friday was that Trump said, or he, maybe it was Thursday night or something, he said, I really, I don't like the optics about Tom Price, which is hilarious. I mean, this is a guy who's gotten three Chinese trademarks. His daughter's gotten three Chinese trademarks from the government in Beijing. He's made no formal separation between his businesses and his presidency. He's basically running a kleptocracy. Um, there are no, uh, there's no transparency in the visitor logs are all secret. No one knows who's coming to Oval Office for meetings and influencing the president. He has doubled the fees at membership fees at Mar-a-Lago. He has no problem with bad optics as long as they're for him, but not for anybody else. So the Ryan Zinke thing could become this problem where he's speaking to a populist base that will forgive him anything including shooting someone on Fifth Avenue 
as he so famously said, but will not forgive the other people around him who might be behaving in swampy fashion. So that is an interesting thing. But what I was also interested to see in the Daily Beast this afternoon, Jay, was that White House aides supportive of the president and critical of Rex Tillerson were hoping he would resign today. In his beginning of his press conference, where it was a little bit of a hostage video, countenance and he was, you know, sort of really somber and it sort of sounded like he was going to step down, they would like to be rid of him. So there's a real tension between the um, adult group, the little adult club of John Kelly, James Mattis, um, and and uh, H.R. McMaster, who want Tillerson to stay in that position and believe that he has the prestige and the respect around the world and, and the heft. Um, to, to, that, to, to, that he should stay in that job and sort of get through all the bumps and scrapes with the president, who's very difficult to work for. And Tillerson, who's thinking, you know, if I'm asked directly by Chris Wallace on a Sunday show about the remarks that the president made following Charlottesville, I am certainly not going to pick up for that. I'm just going to say he speaks for himself. Yep. And this is a man who was one of the most powerful people in the world as head of ExxonMobil. He ran the place. He did not have to answer to reporters coming up to his face when he got off an airplane about contentious national security issues. He was private. He liked to be alone with his documents. He probably didn't have to read too many of them. And now he's been asked by a president who wants him to slash the State Department by 37% mm -hmm. to streamline the place. He's doing it in a sort of corporate way that is too slow. And, and then whenever he wants to hire somebody, the West Wing wants to centralize the hiring and run the picks through the president's team to make sure no one is being considered whoever was critical of the president um, on the campaign. And most of the people in the sort of Republican national security apparatus were critical of President Trump, some of them signing a letter saying, like, he's totally unfit for this job. So um, I think Tillerson could still be fired. And because he said he was has full confidence in him today. Maybe that means this Friday. But um, I but I do think that um, the prism through which we see these things uh, is is really uh, it's been so upended that it's really hard to. I too was surprised that Price was fired. And Jared and Ivanka have pretty much been relegated to some basement. No one's really seen them recently or heard from them. So they're in like a like a bunker somewhere. And I don't know if that's Russia related, but it's very obvious. Yep. That their they're, private email server. Yeah. <laughs> Which is also another story that they don't love. Right. Um, so the president has been criticized this week for his handling, his response to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, the basically getting into a Twitter war with the, the mayor of San Juan, um, and to some degree his response to Las Vegas calling the Las Vegas you know, first responders' response miraculous somehow, miraculous that 59 people died and more than 500 were injured. Um, and a lot of people were upset by that. Does he pay any price for fumbling these kinds of responses? <laughs> like, you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> My husband and I had a conversation last night, and I actually watched, uh, you'd call it a, a round table, but uh, in Puerto Rico on the square. This is how old I am. Governor Roseo's father was the governor and was my client 20 years ago. <laughs> you know you're old when like their son has grown up to be the governor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I, I have a deep affection for Puerto Rico because a long time ago I used to spend a lot of time there working. Um, when he made the comment about Katrina, and my sister is a Katrina survivor two blocks off the beach in past Christiane, Mississippi. My family went five days without hearing from her, so I'm pretty sensitive to that and thin-skinned about it. I'm, I can't believe I'm about to defend him on this, but I actually understood what he was trying to say, which was really a compliment to the work of FEMA and everyone that so much has been learned from Katrina, that it's amazing that with preparedness and warning, loss of life was greatly diminished, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He's just not um, a smooth communicator. Whether you like what he's saying or not, set that apart, he's not articulate in that way, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's enough anxiety out there waiting for him to fumble, right, that, that even that. So I actually found myself yesterday saying, that's not really what he meant, I don't think. Um, and that's kind of weird coming from me to hear me um, defending on that. But in, but in these other moments, um, this is also the distant. I think this is a demonstration of the personality that's far away from people he's serving, right? He's really in the bubble of the White House, oh, yeah. right? 
And the closest he gets even to his supporters is on a stage at a big rally, right? He, d he was never the candidate. He ran a grassroots campaign, but he was never in the kitchens in the Iowa. No reach out campaign. And, no. Right. And None. so that, <laughs> I actually think that informs a lot of leaders as they mature as communicators. Mm -hmm. um, those, you know, those days around um, bakery tables in New Hampshire for Bill Clinton, right, or for George W. Bush, uh, the kinds of conversations he had on the road. Uh, and I don't know that this president has really had those. Apparently, he has not. Because <laughs> uh, he doesn't seem to get any better at it. He doesn't get any better at reading a teleprompter. He doesn't get any better at delivering remarks. He doesn't get really any better at doing anything except offending more and more people in new and different ways, um, which is remarkable. And, and, you know, so on the one hand, you say, is he, is he, isn't he going to be hurt by this? On the other hand, he's kind of been hurt about as, he's been pushed down about as far as any president has ever been pushed down in terms of approval ratings. I'm a little surprised that he still is at 36 or 37, wherever he's well, at today. George W. Bush was the lowest at 29%, I believe, um, during the whole at TARP. Fourth. Yeah, TARP bailout, and like the economy collapsed, you know, everything. That was understandable. <laughs> that was so. But, was but his, but his, his, his Puerto Rico. Trump came up four yeah. or five points during the first two hurricanes where he wasn't on TV. Well, and when he, and when but he, the Puerto and when Rico, he, the, the AP has a poll out today that is 32% approves of his response to Puerto Rico. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he's very close on the question. To so that's pretty, pretty bad. Pretty he did tick up a little bit, and he ticked up, he ticked up, it was partly a response to the hurricane, I think, but it was also partly a response to the, uh, what, what he referred to as the Chuck and Nancy. Um, yeah, um, which was 71% popular. Was, which was sort of, you yeah. know, for a lot of people in America, um, the first time they'd seen a, a president bring leaders of the other party up by themselves right. and cut a deal that they both sort of, uh, you know, agreed yeah. to and abided by in a very, very long time. So, so I think he was on the right track for about five seconds. Um, and he's now back to insulting and offending. So, but, but you know, but I, 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 in fairness to him today, his staff got him to read something in Vegas, and compared to yesterday when he talked about scoring and grades and reviews and uh, huzzas and pats on the back and all the thank yous. When he was in Puerto Rico, he was like, we're doing so great. That's what everyone keeps telling us. We're doing so great. And he didn't do that in Vegas today. They got him to read something, and he was just really thankful to the first responders. And he read something really somber and very nicely written. But then when he was sort of loose with the first responders that I heard, he was, he just said thank you and he knew when to stop. I mean, there was a difference between yesterday, I think, and today, and someone got to him and he listened that this was not the place to go in and say, well, at least it wasn't this and at least it wasn't that. He just had to say, this is terrible and I'm so sorry. And he sort of, you know, someone got him to be a little bit more, not a consoler today, but just not to make it about him. Well, and, and let, me, let me take a little bit of what each of my friends have said up here, because I think it's fascinating. Kiki says his lack of articulate uh, speaking style. And it's hard for a president. I mean, for having worked for George W. Bush, who is the most articulate guy when you talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, and you put a camera in front of him, and he just blanks, yeah. um, that it was hard for him to project a sense of comfort before the camera. I will agree with Steve that, I, you know, his ability to use the Twitter machine to connect to his base is one thing, but I don't think he's really fully embraced the idea that he's president of the United States. Like, he's president of the base, and he'll play to the base and insult the governor. And it's kind of hard for me, for having been through Katrina with President Bush and the, the terrible optics of him flying over, of there's Donald Trump, the president of the United States, in his gated community in Bedminster, New Jersey, getting in a Twitter fight with the mayor of San Juan, wandering through Just human on waste a mm -hmm. on a boat, and he's attacking her. And you say, my goodness, I mean, don't you recognize the gravity <laughs> of the job that you have? But I do think this is his Hurricane Katrina moment. Whether he likes it or not, whether we agree with the responsiveness and what FEMA and the federal agencies were able to do, people are now paying attention and say, we saw this with Bush. He's getting in these Twitter fights, and I think this is going to be a baseline <laughs> that either he's going to fall beneath this in public popularity because people think he didn't do enough or care enough, or whether, as you said, A.B., of, well, at least his staff got him to read something. And I thought the same thing. I was like, wow, you weren't shooting from the hip. Well, he's change. graded on a curve. That's for sure. He, I mean, no, I think his supporters yes. would agree. I mean, the 35% yes. who he is graded on a curve. Yes. But um, 
I think most Americans want to believe that he will occasionally listen to his staff and that he doesn't do it enough, but that they hope that he will. And so um, on something as desperately heartbreaking as what's going on in Vegas, you know, I think it was a relief oh, yeah. that, you know, that, that I, I'm not going to call him presidential. I don't think his greatest supporters would call him presidential. But, but he sort of rose to the occasion and did not make it um, about grades and reviews and, you know, all the plaudits he's getting and about his government. It was just, I'm so sorry, you know, yeah. which is appropriate. Steve, For once. Steve raised something interesting, which was when you talked about the fact that, but he continued to go on and offend more people. And, if, and, and I actually, I wonder this. I don't know that he's offending more people. I think he's offending the same people over and over again, right? In new and I different think, ways. Uh, in new and different ways, but it's not like it's changing the numbers dramatically, right? To Ron's point, he has a floor. He knows what it is. The guy knows numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what some Americans, or I, I think what most Americans are doing, so whether you're in the, that floor <laughs> compartment of the president's supporters, and if you're not, right? And, after the election, there were some who were hanging in the middle who voted both in the opposite direction, but could have been easily, for a variety of reasons, be pulled in the other direction. I think rather than looking at the president, I think those two sets of Americans are looking at each other, mm. saying, how can you not be offended by that? How, why are you so easily offended by everything? Nobody else was getting anything done before. And so I think the the idea i think people who walk around with an analysis and say well eventually there's going to be a tipping point where he's offended everyone so badly he can't he can't be in this role or he'll walk away or somebody will call for his impeachment i think that's not happening i see I, I don't know i guess i think of this as the the greatest reality show that ever existed right and he is so good i mean every week we're on television and <clears throat> instead of talking about the demise of healthcare we're talking about mika brzezinski's facelift Demise of healthcare one. Instead of talking about the demise of healthcare two, we were talking about right. you know Anthony Scaramucci and what he really thought of Reince yeah. Peebus. You know what right. I mean? Like instead of talking about the Russia investigation, we're talking about you know or or Hurricane Maria. We're right. talking about his Twitter war with the mayor, right? Right. And so <clears throat> I think, excuse me, I think he's brilliant at wagging yes. the dog and, 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 and like and getting people to talk yes. about the latest episode of the Kardashians in the White House and who's at whose throat and like what we're doing. Um, and not actually talking about anything substantive, but the rules of television are clear. At some point, every show, even Happy Days, jumps the shark, right? And so, will he jump the shark? I don't know if Happy Days jump the shark. But isn't that where it came from? It or came from there. Yes, <laughs> the Fonz jumped there, the shark. There are some of us here who are old enough to identify that, yeah. <laughs> and you guys are looking at us like, what in the heck are you talking about? <laughs> Google it. Well, I, I, think, I, I think he's almost there. I mean, I think he's almost there. And it goes to the point of everything. What's, that, what's there, though, Ron? The, the there of the jump the shark moment of Americans are realizing, Kiki, that there's no fundamental substance, right? We're talking about his tweets. We're talking about his insults. We're talking about everything that Trump's doing and saying as the reality show president. But I look at our president, and it, again, for having worked with George W. Bush, I mean, we had meetings three times a week. We had a message meeting of, what's the president going to say tomorrow? We'd meet on Wednesday and say, what's the president going to say next week? And then we'd have one on Friday to say, what's the president's message for the next three months? I don't think that this administration, and believe me for having spoken to people in the communication yeah. shop, they say, Ron, we, we don't have any long-term planning. We don't have any long-term other than this is what we're going to do today or tomorrow. And you can't run a presidency that way. You have to lay out to the American people, this is why you elected me. Here's how I'm following up on my promises that I made to you. And if I didn't follow up on those promises, I'm going to find a way to, to keep them. Bashing the Senate Majority Leader, bashing Ryan, bashing Congress, bashing folks on television, people are thinking, can you do anything constructive rather than just participate in behavior or being destructive? I, I would tell you that that is how we used to measure politics. And I, I lean more and more to the concept that he does have a message. He knows, ex to your point, he knows exactly what he's saying. And he delivers a message on health care. He delivers a message on tax reform. He delivers a message on foreign policy. He has probably one of the most defined foreign policy profiles of any president in our history. Most of them have to be in office a good three or four years to have a defined profile. Now, the question is, 
if we see the numbers, the numbers play around in a five-point range, 37 to 42, maybe they're down on one specific question, but we know where that floor is. It's around 37, 38% for him. The question is, compared to who? <laughs> Who's going to challenge him in a primary? Mm. Right? Because after that, it doesn't matter. We don't know who a Democratic nominee will be yet in 2020. We've got a field of about 20 plus people. And so, um, well, watch what my old boss is doing, Kiki. John I, Kasich is yeah. running around the country raising a lot of he's money a, these days. A, I'm a Kasich fan. You know that. I do. But here's, um, but, but here's the thing, though, Keith and Ron. So he's at 36, 37, 38 percent. And maybe he has a primary opponent. Maybe he doesn't. I suspect he will. But, yeah. but, um, but he'll have an easier time with a primary opponent at 36 or 37 percent, which is almost all partisan Republican support. Right, all base. Then he will have in a general election against any Democrat if he doesn't do something to move those numbers up. Agreed. Because in a two-way race, when you're at 36, you're going to have a very, That's very a hard time, time winning. That's a long time from now, though. I, it is That's a long time, my, but the po my point about, yeah. and whether he's insulting different people in new and different ways, or the same people in new and different ways, I believe it's, it's not so much about jumping the shark or his numbers going from 35 down to 31 or 28. I think it's more about hardening the opposition to the point, to the people, of the people who are not in the 35 or 36 or 37, mm -hmm. to the point where they would never, under any circumstance, consider voting to reelect him. And that's really, that's really the, the, the barometer that I think he needs to be paying attention to. Because Barack Obama fell into the 40s mm -hmm. um, after 2010, but, but he, wasn't, he wasn't disqualified in most people's minds. He was a disappointment. Yeah. And, and you can be a president who's a disappointment and recover. You, you can't recover once people decide that you're disqualified. And I think that's, that's, that's a more um, risky, uh, that's, a, that's a greater risk for him right now than than him going down to 31 or 28 or 29. But the most important thing in terms of his polling, let's just measure between now and November of 2018, to be this really consequential window of whether or not um, he can get anything done. He doesn't really work with the Congress. He just tells them they better get a bill over to his desk. But that's fine. I mean, and, and the onus really should, in a lot of ways, be on Republicans who haven't been able to pass out a health care bill, et cetera, because they promised that they would. But he, Maggie Haberman in the New York Times, who has the best Trump sources on the planet, including the president himself, who's very, very, cannot quit Maggie Haberman. Every time he's, every None time. None of us can quit Maggie I mean, Haberman. I really I'm think he calls her at two in the morning. Yeah. So, so she said something so interesting last week, which I think we all have sort of a sense of, but that she's very articulate about it. She says in her very calm, soft voice that this is a president who thinks really five minutes at a time. So when you think. He lives in this, literally, this amount of oxygen. And so he, when you guys think that it's eight-dimensional chess and he's really strategizing about keeping, he knows how to sort of fire up the base in a panicked moment when he's made a mistake or something. But he doesn't have a grand plan. And so the Chuck and Nancy thing was a backup in a rage at congressional Republican leaders that was designed to show them I can cut a deal, and I can yep. do what I want to do. And I actually think, I know if he doesn't get tax reform, he will blame congressional Republicans and run against <clears throat> them in the 28 term, 2018 midterms, which will probably deliver a Democratic House. But he hasn't figured that out yet. <clears throat> and give Nancy Pelosi's caucus subpoena power and the whole thing. But um, he's made it clear he's going to run against Republicans. That's, 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 and, and that's clear. But what's interesting, and I host No Labels Radio, and I am a nonpartisan, bipartisan looker, searcher for progress here. If he actually breaks down and does some weird, really like substantive deal with the Democrats, um, I don't think it has to even be a big deal. But let's say some transportation projects for some tax. Well, what about I don't guns? know. Can he do guns? That's no. I don't think he'll do guns. But if he does something mm -hmm. with Democrats, even if it's just to sort of warn Republicans or whatever, I think that was 71% number in polling of, was over the Chuck and Nancy three-month deal. Repub Americans loved that. And so he actually can actually break into the 44, 45 zone in approval, I think, if he works with Democrats. 
and some Republicans. I think if he continues fighting everybody, I was fascinated by a recent CNN panel that Alison Camerata did with some Trump voters. And they actually, some of them were saying, I realize it's really all about himself. And so not every hardcore 34% Trump lover is really going to hang in if he doesn't rack up some accomplishments and they start to feel that on cue, every time he runs into a buzzsaw, he'll just pick on a mayor of, of, Port of San Juan. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. To, to but, deflect and to distract. But, but to that end, so begin to think, put our traditional hats on and begin to think, what do accomplishments look like, right? We all sit in this auditorium and talk about headlines, right? So tax reform, health care, immigration, North Korea, Iran, right? Yep. For this week, mm -hmm. maybe. Well, okay. for the next 30 the minutes. The number of administrative moves that have been made below the radar right. mm -hmm. that are fulfilling to mainstream Republican agendas, yeah. not just Freedom Caucus, not just Tea Party, not just far right, but mainstream yeah. business Republicans, regulatory rollbacks, yep are hugely popular. This is a guy who got elected with the smallest presidential ad campaign budget ever, so you can probably confirm Well, no, but we us. haven't counted the Russians yet. Well, right, okay. So. Oh, <laughs> or the Facebook ads. But all of that micro policy, anybody ever remember another president who got reelected with small policy? Anybody know who that was? Go ahead and tell them. Bill, Bill Clinton. Clinton. 1996. Mm. Didn't get reelected on middle class tax cut, he got elected on that. He got reelected on community policing and school uniforms. Kind of mm -hmm. weird. OK, it was bigger than that. And I'm going to get an email tomorrow telling me I didn't do that right. But, um, <laughs> but, but that still kind of micro. What you say. Say They're what? still policing what you say. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say who it is that polices me. <laughs> but anyway, um, but that kind of micro messaging <clears throat> is ripe for digital. Yeah. I mean, so, so he, his team already has the Bannon board. Mm -hmm. What did oh, you say right. you were going to do that you did that we can run you again on? So I just want to be very clear that for the mainstream Republicans who yeah. might be uncomfortable with the style and that, they, right, there's a lot that's happened regulatorily and in executive action that appeals to you and some of your friends. It, it does. So um, when no, I was... I'm glad we didn't have enough to say here tonight. I know, right? Yeah, we've got nothing to say. <laughs> nothing at all. Um, I remember being in Cleveland at the Republican National Convention and having drinks at the CNN Grill with... Um, a former McConnell staffer who could not quite bring himself sober to go into the hall for, Trump, for Donald Trump's uh, victory speech. And he was talking about how his biggest fear wasn't Hillary Clinton winning. His biggest fear was that Donald Trump would win, and they would keep the House and keep the Senate, and how much pressure Mitch McConnell would be under to get rid of the legislative filibuster. Um, and then you look at Mitch McConnell these days, who's always kind of looked like a droopy dog, and he looks like the un most unhappy man on the planet. right? So. It, do you, can you see Mitch McConnell getting rid of the legislative filibuster anytime no. soon? No. Nope. If not, then how does he get anything through Congress? Well, you know, a guy like McConnell has to be looking at Ryan Zinke and thinking, how did you let me down? I mean, McConnell's big challenge, this should be a year for Republicans to do very, very well in the midterm elections. But you get a guy like Zinke who decides to go to the administration. You don't put a Heidi Heitkamp or a Joe Manchin in the cabinet of conservative or moderate Democrats that we would likely, oh, with two Republican governors that would then appoint their replacements, that you have to start thinking that McConnell's looking at himself and he's looking at the math and he's looking at the president and saying, I thought I should have 65, 66, 67 seats, and now here I am, 52, 48, and I don't see myself moving the needle that much further given the way that the atmosphere is. And so I don't think he has the votes to get rid of the filibuster. I don't think he has the votes even to hold the caucus together on tax reform. I mean, I've been the guy saying for months now, if you think we were bad as it relates to health care reform, just wait until you get Republicans talking about all sorts of deductions, trying to repatriate money. You're going to have different factions that will never reach a threshold to get enough Democrats to come together and say, let's get tax reform through. So I'm rather pessimistic that McConnell can get the wins on the board, that he can recruit the candidates that he needs to expand his majority, and in fact, this might be a squeaker election in the Senate. Wow. But yeah, that, that, that tweeting that the president does about the filibuster is just, it's just a remarkable example of, of kind of what conversations he didn't have before he <laughs> ran for president or won the presidency, and what 
concessions he's unwilling to make because they say this stuff behind closed doors to him. He's so, he put so much pressure publicly on McConnell several times this spring about the filibuster and summer that a couple of senators had to write like an op-ed about why it's the greatest thing ever. I mean, yeah. this is really uh, an indication that um, that 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 he's almost in their like in their way, like an impediment to. Now, like I said, I don't blame President Trump for the failure of the health care appeal because the whole ground has shifted. Obamacare is in free fall. It is a disaster. But it doesn't mean that the country wants it repealed. And it doesn't mean the Republican Party has the votes to repeal it. And it doesn't mean that Trump, even though he would sign anything, any repeal, to say that he fulfilled a promise, he, he was voted in by people who depend on a deeper safety net, older, whiter people in the, older white people in the Rust Belt, people who are, not, uh, who, who are you know, looking for th this kind of coverage and some subsidies to pay for it. And these deductibles are going up, and these premiums are going up, and it is totally out of control. Insurance companies are leaving the program and threatening to leave the program. That said, the ground underneath this political debate has changed. And totally. so shame on Republicans for being caught, um, sort of not being willing to adjust to, to the reality and still pretending they have to repeal it. When they know they can't repeal it, well, on this side that you probably it's unrepealable. The, the I, I'm like so pro-Trump <coughs> today, I can't get over this. <clears throat> but the, I mean, the president is right to point his fingers at Republican leadership. No, I right? understand that. A, but the, on, on healthcare in yeah. particular. I mean, what you raise on healthcare is really important because the reality is this guy wasn't in charge of getting rid of Obamacare for the last seven years. Right. They were. But he shouldn't, at the same time, he makes their lives miserable. Just nails on no, a blackboard he he every day with these but, filibuster but, tweets. But that's, why, but that's why I think with his base and others, it's a legitimate argument. No, you know, Like, I just right. got here. I was for it. I thought they told me they were ready to do this. And we so I got seven here, years. And they had nothing. Seven right. years to put together a plan, a series of plans, a backup plan to the backup plan of, okay, if we get a Republican majority in the Senate. A crazy out there a, model that lasts right? six months. And nothing. we were flat-footed. Yeah. Nothing. Well, but you know, in, okay, I'm I'm not, this is the only time you're ever going to hear me say anything. Are you going to defend Trump now, well, too? Is I'm it you gonna, and me? Bring it, bring wait, it, bring it. Let's just sometimes, trade sides. Let's get Sometimes up you're so stupid that you can be smart. No, oh. no, no, but. That's a McMahon compliment. That is a total McMahon compliment. No, no, so, so Trump, when he, ran, when he ran for president, you know, was going to repeal Obamacare. And at some point, it became repeal and replace. The Republicans, <clears throat> remember, wanted to do a simple, clean, quick repeal keeping Obamacare in place for two years while they figure out the replacement. So that would have fulfilled the problem. Now, Trump was the guy who said, no, 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 no. We're going to do them both the same day. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. We're going to do them both the same day. So Trump, it, it actually is Trump's fault. He can blame the Republican leadership all, of, all he wants. But You um, know what, it, Steve? It, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go back in, in defense of Mitch McConnell. It is really hard to get a repeal and replace that can pass through that conference when the Medicaid expansion well, has become popular in some states. When the president has promised it is going to be the best care, yep. you can keep everything that you want. It's going to be simpler. It's going to be free. cheaper. It's going to be free. But AB, that and people, the government people, will subsidize those people, who can't afford. Nobody it. would remember that. What they would remember is that that the Republicans promised to repeal Obamacare, and so did Donald Trump, and they did it. Yeah. And then they would fight for two years over what it's what it's going to be replaced by, and probably it wouldn't get replaced at the end of two years either. No. But at least they would have kept their promise. Yep. <laughs> As for Mitch McConnell and the filibuster, I used to work for Ted Kennedy and, and, and he had been in this, you know, he was in the Senate for 50 years basically, mm -hmm. 52 years. And uh, his attitude was always, look, these presidents, these guys down here, they come they and come go. And go. Yeah. I'm, I'm here and I'm going to be here when they're gone. Yeah. And I think Mitch McConnell's the same way. Remember, this is a man whose life's ambition wasn't to be president of the United States. Yeah. It was to be Senate Majority Leader. He's yep. got it. He is a man of the institution, and he, I think, sees a weak, pathetic, lying president who may or may not finish his term, and he's not going to do anything. To th and, and, and a guy who is pointing his finger in Mitch's chest all the time and wagging his finger in Mitch's face, he's not going to do anything to diminish his institution to help that yep. man. He's nope. not. You know, the, the funny thing is the person who probably lives more in political peril than McConnell is Ryan. Yeah. Right? Right. Paul, the speaker lives in political peril. 
Some of it is of his own doing and some, a lot of it not yeah. because of the nature of his caucus before you have this president mm -hmm. and then the catalyst that this president is in that caucus for the disarray. Mm -hmm. It's not even discontent, it's disarray <clears throat> oh, within yeah. that caucus. Um, you know, I, I have to say it was, uh, you don't, you haven't, maybe we've seen one moment like this and it was the return of the whip, Steve Scalise, mm -hmm. to the floor where you looked up and you said, <coughs> wow, it's really clear that even though no Democrat agrees with Steve Scalise on his politics, he's actually uh, highly regarded by both caucuses mm -hmm. because he is a, a legislative guy <laughs> who's true to his word. So even if you don't agree with him, you know it, and he, he tells you. And, and you, you just, you, you'd hate to think that somebody has to be shot up and nearly die to have that kind of a reaction when they walk onto the floor of the Senate. Um, it's like being at your own funeral, right? <laughs> Except you, you get to like, talk. Look, look at how many friends <laughs> I have. Except you, Except get, you to get to talk, talk right? So, I mean, it was, it was really quite impressive, and kudos to Mr. Scalise and the career that he's built and the, and the respect he's delivered. But I, I think um, Speaker Ryan lives in a very high state of, uh, of political peril for himself and, and whatever it is he believes the agenda for the House should be. Yeah. Not because he's an incompetent politician either, by the way. He's not. He's, he's a quite accomplished politician. Let, let me pick up on Kiki's point because I think it's an important one. I've, I've, I've known Paul Ryan for 24 years. He's one of my dearer friends and an all-around great guy. And yet, you look at him, he never wanted that job. I mean, he never wanted that job looking no. at what John Boehner, uh, the former Speaker of the House, had gone through. He'd walked the plank. The Freedom Caucus, the 40 or 45 some odd people, the most conservative members of the House, they're running the show. And Ryan took this over to unify the Republicans ostensibly, to unify the House. And instead, I think that we find ourselves more yep. divided, more fractious than ever before. And you look at the Wisconsin 1st District where he's from. I mean, you're talking about a, a district that Hillary Clinton won, that Barack Obama won. He's a Republican in that district. He's doing this at very significant peril. Everyone talks yeah, about. Yeah, he took it for the team. He took it for the totally team. Agree. Everyone talks about Trump being at 39, 37%. Look at what Ryan's numbers are. Ryan's numbers are in the upper 20s, low 30s. I mean, he, he is in a very difficult spot of being even more unpopular than the President of the United States. And can he muscle through significant reform? If it doesn't get done by December and we head into a, the election year, you can forget it. They won't get anything done. So this actually brings me to um, something, the, the sort of one of the big elephant in every room in Washington, and that is impeachment and the Russia investigation. And so I, uh, there was a Republican member of the House who, went, who told me in the beginning of this process that there's going to come a moment where the establishment's going to have to choose between potentially Paul Ryan and and Donald Trump. And you know, and whether you know Paul Ryan is, as you said, Kiki constantly on the hot seat, you know, whether it's the Freedom Caucus with a motion to vacate the chair or um, his, you know, moderates, the, the Tuesday group, eventually signing on to some Democratic discharge petition. And once one of those discharge petitions makes it to the floor, he's also toast, right? He loses his speakership. So he's coming, he's got it out from both sides in a way that even Boehner didn't have it, right? Um, and so at some point, you know, especially if it's a Democratic discharge petition on the investigation into Russia, and there are a bunch of them, does it become an existential crisis where the party has to choose? Do we move to defend Paul Ryan or do we move to impeach the president? And how close do we think this investigation is to impeachment territory? I think that may be a false choice. Now, false I'm, not choice. The, I'm, not the, I'm not the House parliamentarian, nor am I a, a legal scholar. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that it's impeachment mm -hmm. that's at issue, right? Because uh, an investigation that turns up something worthy doesn't have to le go to impeachment. Right, sure. and the reality is, uh, as far as I can tell from the outside, the committee chairs are totally in charge of this. The speaker is not in charge of this, mm -hmm. and you hear it time and time again. And I kind of get the feeling Paul Ryan's just happy to have it be that way. Oh yeah, <laughs> you take Absolutely. it, you run with it, and as long as the special counsel, Mr. Mueller, is doing what he's doing, it's not even in the hands of the House's decision. I just meant it was more. It was more of a choice. Like if one of these. I don't. I don't think they'll have to make the choice for impeachment because if they find stuff that warrants that level mm -hmm. of um, discipline, they'll just bypass impeachment. Mueller takes it and goes with it. Well, but here's here's the here's what I think is is, I don't think Paul Ryan's going to have to worry about impeachment. Yeah. But I think this the, the if if Bob Mueller comes forward with significant evidence or if the Senate. Intelligence Committee or any of these other committees comes forward with significant evidence and and nothing happens in the House of Representatives, which is exactly what I think would would, ha would be the outcome. Mm -hmm. Democrats will probably run on impeachment. Oh, yeah. 
And I think Democrats would then have a decent chance of winning the House of Representatives, in which case all of the current committee chairs will be, will be gone and they'll all be replaced by Democrats, many of whom will have run on impeachment. And it's going to become, it could become, I should say, at that point, sort of a runaway train. I just don't know if it comes and the, quick enough for that, for well, that cycle. The, for, by 2018 in November? So, so then the question becomes, you know, poor Mitch McConnell again. So, <laughs> so if, if the Democrats run an impeachment, win the House, and if, if it does become a runaway train, and they vote on articles, it goes over to the Senate, which I don't think, you know, I'm a Democrat, I hope I'm wrong, but I, you look at the, you look at the, um, the map, and it is pretty difficult to imagine Democrats winning enough seats to take the Senate right now. Nope. Um, so it heads over to Mitch McConnell for a trial in the Senate that Mitch McConnell presides over. And what, uh, can I say shit show? Yeah, I um, just did. And, and so I think I just <laughs> These said, people can't even drink legal yet. And, you can't and, talk and that so way. So at that point, now think about this. How delicious is this? At that point. How delicious. How delicious I'm, and delectable. At that point. The guy that Donald Trump has been berating and belittling and gets insulting to <laughs> gets to be the person who's in charge of whether Preaching he lives or he dies <laughs> politically. Steve. He lives or he dies politically. Are, are you Caesar, fun right? Over there? I'm having so much fun imagining this. Can we write start can we write the book right now? Yeah. But no, seriously, this this is a a somewhat um, unlikely, but not entirely unlikely scenario. It is a potential tale. And wouldn't it be fun to be wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be fun? Would you, don't, don't antagonize the students. I know. So I, um, I have been told I need to start the Q&A. Oh. I was going to ask a question, so I would encourage the students to ask it since I can't ask anymore, about foreign policy. Because we never got to North Korea and Iran, which are big things. So I'm going to throw the um, questions oh, over to the audience. And, uh, <laughs> and who wants to go first? Is anybody going to ask Ron what song he's going to sing They first? already know. First this year? Oh, no, I haven't thought about that yet. Is there some like karaoke competition I'm missing? Well, yeah, stay tuned. Well, they have some secret no, karaoke actually, club, is, obviously. Here, let me just speak like the president. No, there's no karaoke competition. It's never occurred. I don't care what country you think it might have happened, and it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Although we're telling Cynthia. Yeah. Oh, she knows. There's no question. There's one in the back. There yeah. she is. Oh, no, that's not Here's a question. Cynthia. That's just a wave. That's just that Steve's wife. You guys can wave to Cynthia. That's, that's what happens in my class all the time. It'll be like, it'll be like I'll friend. call on somebody. That, I, did you have a question? Bit, no, it's just itching it, my forehead. If no one is going to ask a question, I am going oh, to. Oh, wait, there's one in the there, red okay, hat right I was going to go ahead and ask foreign right policy, but okay. Uh, okay, uh, on uh, Iran and especially North Korea, uh, can you say something about the pluses and minuses of uh, often uh, adversarial tone of addressing pr problems as it uh, might apply to, say, d domestic tragedies that have people understandably uh, upset, and uh, but all trying to work for the same thing versus confronting uh, foreign blackmailers and madmen? <laughs> That's a short question. <laughs> <laughs> Ron will have something to say on that. Oh, sure. Look, let me, let me say that if you look at the way that Trump has handled Iran, I mean, he, he's clearly given a lot of foreign leaders around the world cause for concern. Um, one of the things I do in my, my daytime job is then the BBC political analyst at, for North America, and they are dumbfounded in capitals around Europe and in Asia as to how the president can have such a bellicose attitude towards Iran when they think that the deal is working. They think that it gives an opportunity to at least keep Iran contained and checked. And they can't understand how the same bellicosity that he uses towards Iran, he uses towards leaders of his own party on domestic issues. And they're just, I can't say dumbfounded enough. Um, as it relates to North Korea, same thing. You look at, at the president's uh, national security team, his generals that we hear about all the time, uh, and my folks in the national security apparatus tell me that the folks in the military are very concerned that we could be ratcheting up tension in North Korea at a time that the diplomats, and you heard the president say this just the other day, that Tellerson's wasting his time talking, uh, as the Secretary of State, talking uh, to the North Koreans. And it, from my view, it's sending a mixed message around the world as to what the American foreign policy agenda is and what does it stand for. But you know why he does it. Of course. Nobody's calling him on it. Nobody. 
right? Republican leadership in Congress are not calling him on it. You've had Corker, well, Corker. slightly, so, um, yeah. slightly. This week, <laughs> finally. Know? But but the reality is until leaders in Congress stand up and say, not having it, we're done with you. I mean, they're, right. the, the people with the power to change the dynamic are actually the leaders in Congress. They actually yeah. have the capacity and the power to change the dynamic of what's going on. I, I agree. Two Saturdays ago, long time in 2017. <laughs> like five years ten ago. Ten days seem Trump like world. ten months. Um, two Saturdays ago, if you'll remember, the president threatened nuclear war on Twitter on Saturday night. He had seen the comments of the foreign minister at the UN General Assembly, and he didn't like what he heard, so he said, if he uh, follows the thoughts of Little Rocket Man, they won't be around much longer. And then he woke up the next morning and went after the NFL and made sure that he stayed on the NFL for five days straight. But I sat around waiting for one person from the leadership of the Republican Party to come out and say, I'm sorry, yeah. we don't do that. I'm sure General Kelly ran in on Sunday morning and said, we we're going to really try not to say things like that again on a Saturday <laughs> night on your phone. But the point is, so the silence equals acquiescence. Of course. And that kind of signal in terms of you know what voice he uses you know internationally. He, I mean, he pays no he's, price. It's really I mean, unbelievable because actually yeah. on North Korea, I will give the president credit. He has gotten the Chinese to at least say that they are they've asked their central bank bank to stand down on anything, any transactions with the North Koreans. Now they've stopped some coal shipments or something, but you know they, they've monkeyed around and, and still helped the North Koreans for months. And that actual announcement, if it is enforced, is actually consequential and is a, is a significant accomplishment for this administration if he could just quiet down and not run his mouth. But this kind of thing about threatening nuclear war and then really just throwing his secretary of state, who was in China this weekend, um, under the bus in that tweet about, we don't need to talk to them, we don't, we're going to take care of them, we know what to yeah. do, or whatever the tweet was. It's a waste of time. Was. But I mean, it was yeah. really astounding. Imagine what the Chinese think, especially in that culture where at the highest levels of officialdom in China, you know, saving face and being re respectful is the first order. I mean, that he, that Trump would do that to Tillerson, send the mixed signal about military versus diplomatic, but then also to just be that way to his own Secretary of State while he was in China scares the pants off of people and, and, and actually undermines what the Trump administration is trying to do to get the Chinese to help us on North Korea. So it, it's really an amazing thing. It's a one step forward, five steps back, all because of kind of his, his bombast. So I actually have a question for Ron. Um, because I'm one of these people who, you know, for a long time have watched many Republicans who I didn't agree with on very many things, but I thought they were honorable, patriotic Americans. And, and, I, and I wonder why we haven't heard more from the Senate Republican leadership or from Senate rank and file members. And, and at what point, and my question is, what are you hearing with respect to the breaking point? Are they closer, or are they just going to continue to ignore <laughs> the lunacy and madness and pretend like it's not really occurring? No, Steve, I think we're close. And I, I think you're seeing it uh, reflected by Bob Corker deciding not to run, by my friend Charlie Dent, a great no-labels guy. He is. A, De Charlie Dent's a great no-labels guy. Yeah, um, awesome. Deciding not to run from just right outside of Philadelphia. You're seeing members right now look at the political calculus in the House and in the Senate and say, if I stick too closely with Trump, do I get singed and burned by Icarus doing whatever he's doing? Yeah. And I think there are a lot of Republicans right now that say, if we don't get a legislative accomplishment in October, November, before we get out of here, then I'm going to run for re-election, and I'm going to cut bait with the president, and I'm going to try to run and win on my own. Or they're going to retire. Or they're going to retire. If there's no tax reform. And, but, and, was, that, was that the lesson of Alabama? But will they call him out? Well, it's one thing to go see, away quietly. See, so they, they, they won't, the, they, they the won't call him out. The reality is, he could be a Democrat, he could be a Republican, he could be a Green Party independent. This is not a statement on his politics. He currently pays no political price for his actions. Nope. He's paid no political price, so why would he change? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a human condition, right? 
whether you're two and you put your hand in the cookie jar or you're 25 and you drink the extra beer, which y'all won't because you're not old enough yet, and then you'll know better by the time you are. <laughs> and then, or you're 50 years old and you perform at your job because you pay a price if you don't. Right now, he's paid no political price, so there will be no change in the behavior. Right? Well, but then the question is, was Alabama an example for every Republican running that he doesn't have control of this base and his coattails are minuscule, if non-existent, and his endorsement in 2018 will potentially harm you more than help you, and therefore you may as well cut bait and run against him at this I point. I don't know that his endorsement harmed who he supported. You know, the other guy's a pretty dramatic personality in the state to begin with. That's a polite and statement. And I, you know, I haven't had a chance to really dig into the numbers of turnout uh-huh. in that race. Relatively low. Yeah. So that's, it's not hard to put an extremist in an off-year special, I mean, it's not hard to do. No, but if I'm a Steve McMahon or if I'm Kiki, because you're independent, I am loving Roy Moore. Right? He's the oh, guy that keeps on giving. We love. I mean, he, you guys. <laughs> I, mean, the, I hope you got a shot of I hope he brings. Love I hope he brings Roy his big Moore. gun yeah. to the United States Senate. Yeah. I mean, his comments about race, about women, about Muslims, about like you check you took off every erogenous zone for a Democrat. Yeah. Um, this is what we think that the that the Republicans are. I think this conversation is going off the rails. Yeah. But I mean, you guys, the, the ads write themselves. But that's true, and and it's something to think about for every Republican incumbent next year who's running for anything. They will be asked about Roy Moore's comments, and they are they're going to be damned if they back them, and they'll be damned if they criticize them. Yep. I mean, they are in a vice. Beautiful. Grip. It's it is a nightmare. Beautiful. Um, and, 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 but this is where a party look. As somebody who worked for Bill Clinton in 1990 and 1991, you know, I always I try to remind people right now that in 1990, only about eight people knew Bill Clinton, and five of them hated him, and they were Democrats. Right. Right. It's like people forget Bill Clinton was hated by his party. Right. Yeah. But that party was in complete disarray with no leadership, sure. and there were factions at war, and we were paying a price for it in Congress. We were paying a price for it in other elections, and the reality is, it took a rebel rousing visionary leader to come in and take control of the party and take the reins. Is and that right, Trump? And no. no <laughs> or is it Roy Moore? No, no but right, <laughs> well, my suggestion is that that person has not yet presented itself in the Republican Party. Because you have two long term elected officials and the two leaders. It's really hard to do that as a leader in Congress, right? Yeah. You've been there a long time. It's not like you've got new energy to bring into it. You don't have to be young necessarily to do it. But you have to come from somewhere on the outside to do that. And that person hasn't presented That's themselves That's a really yet. good point. And, and the question is, is it a governor? Is it somebody who's about to get elected governor? And Republicans are going to struggle for two more sides? I don't know. But is, on, it, is it I, Kanye I West? Want, <laughs> I just wanted to add really quickly off topic, and then I'll we should give the floor back. But because but yeah. you are covering, po- you are learning about politics, studying politics, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this partisan voting index. And if you're not, you really need to be. Yes. I mean, My Ron classes. is right. This is an amazing, amazing thing. That Nancy Pelosi is like a PVI plus thirty six, which means yep. in her district she she doesn't she doesn't meet Republicans, she doesn't talk to them, she doesn't hear from them. She is completely out of touch with like the main line, which is you're either plus four or five or minus four or five if you're in a swingable district. And and Ryan's in like a plus five or yep. something. I mean, he is Literally, Four or by five. the skin of his teeth, keeping his popularity, which is pretty high at home, it's low nationally. He is a constituent serving lawmaker and a really good representative who has taken one for the team to have his potential, I guess, you know, future um, really decimated. I think it would be looking a lot better if Hillary Clinton was president for Paul Ryan. So, just it's just something for you to think about in terms of how few districts actually do swing. And what the politics are like for someone like a Paul Ryan in this Russia impeachment, you know, all these conversations we're having going forward. What if tax reform fails? I mean, it's really a, it's just something interesting to watch because I think people don't know that Mm -hmm. and they assume that everyone in leadership is safe. Mm -hmm. And they're not. And he's not. Paul is pretty pretty well known. I mean, I've been to his district campaigning with him. I've milked a goat with him at the Racine County Fair. No, he does it right. I mean, yeah, when he did, did that town hall, did you make that to me? He knew card? everyone knew him. <laughs> oh yeah, they, they all and know they, him. You know, he knew he was like, okay, Bonnie, you know, taking questions from the audience. They all knew it was him. Pretty amazing. Yeah, he knew everybody. Back to Puerto Rico and politics. They want uh, you to use the mic because it's on online. Puerto Rico and politics. Uh, it, do you think it had any effect 
on the president's responsiveness to uh, the hurricane that the people of Puerto Rico do not have a presidential vote. They do not have an electoral vote. Uh, they don't have any voting congressmen or senators. They vote senators. in primaries, in presidential uh, and, and, primaries. And in the primaries, they went for the Florida senator mm. by 78%. Uh, so um, they could be on his enemies list. Uh, to be fair, neither does Columbia, the District of Columbia, right? I, so actually, I, actually think, I actually think it had more to do with the fact that he didn't want to interrupt his weekend at the Bedminster Country Club where he was, where he was chilling know, out, chilling watching out the golf and hanging come. out with his friends than, than anything that was, that was um, as <laughs> thoughtful or as intentional, uh, intentional as what you, what you suggest. But that's just because I think you know, that's the way he behaves. No, but Steve, you're right. I mean, I, I was bitching about this on television, saying the optics of this are terrible. You're behind a gated community at a golf course with your name on the front, and people are suffering and they're harmed. And he didn't seem bothered. In fact, he wanted to be there to hand out the President's Cup. And, and to your point, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't give him the, I don't know how to say this carefully, because of course the Trump people, every time I say something bad about him on television, I hear oh, go about ahead it. and say it. Mm -hmm. Just look at the camera. So we yeah, have good footage. Right. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that the electoral calculus didn't factor through his mind in his hurricane response decisions. But if he was playing eight-dimensional chess, he would have realized that some of them, a bunch of them, could get really mad and move to Florida if the island's decimated and start voting. So, I think if he was three steps ahead, maybe he would have <laughs> considered that. He would have made a different decision. Right. Questions? In the middle here. Uh, you talked about youth and energy coming from the right, but do you see any any leadership, any vision, youth and energy on the left besides you know Chuck and Nancy? Yeah, actually I do. Um, well, you know, um, going back to that window of 1990 when everybody thought there was no leadership in the party, we're actually just entering the window when you begin to hear from people who might be interested in running for president, and they begin to share their own point of view. I'm a, I'm a former staffer at the Democratic National Committee. I'm a former staffer at the Democratic Leadership Council, which were the rebel rousers, which mm -hmm. kind of elbowed out the party people at one point and took over the party. Um, and so uh, there's, I, so I'm a firm believer that the, actually the party apparatus doesn't make message. It's really the leaders who present themselves. And it's really over the next 18 months, you'll begin to hear from people and you'll come to know people you never knew of before. Steve Bullock, the governor of Montana. You'll begin to hear from people like Mitch Landrieu. While what mm. what people have heard from him recently is this the speech he gave over the statues, the Confederate statues in New Orleans. This guy was actually the lieutenant governor during <coughs> Katrina in Louisiana, and some people would say he was the governor that that got Louisiana Absolutely. through Katrina. So he'll he'll have that narrative that comes with him. You'll hear from the Kirsten Gillibrands. There are people I know who would like to hear from Kamala Harris. I don't know what her decision will be as a as a freshman senator, but so. People who aren't name brands yet across America will begin to present their voices. You're going to hear them in speeches. Andrew Cuomo, who uh, is a really interesting governor of New York, right? Uh, really disliked by some far left partisans, known for cutting deals. I would suggest in an analysis that Governor Cuomo is almost anti-partisan as opposed to bipartisan. And I think there's actually a little bit of difference. And, and I, I do say that. The other thing. We've lost, Democrats have lost so much in the state legislatures, right? It's a very yeah. small community. So we actually kind of get to know who's in office. And there are some really um, stellar young leaders that aren't 2020 prime time for president, but you're going to see a roster of candidates for governor in the next two cycles that will look stronger. We're not going to go back, and Democrats aren't going to win 20 of them. I happen to, we spend a lot of time talking about the presidency here. I happen to have a long time crush on governors. I think governors yep. are the bee's knees. They make stuff happen. They're CEOs. They're the people who are qualified to be president. Mm -hmm. That's why there's a history in modern American politics of electing governors to the presidency. Um, and, and frankly, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I can feel it coming. Um, but boy, I sure would put my attention and resources in governor's races if I wanted to build up a party into the yeah. future and not really worry about control of the House or the Senate. Yep. In so, the next two yeah. cycles. I have to ask, 2020, you don't think Hillary will, Hillary will run again? I, I don't know what she'll do. You know, I didn't think she would run for the Senate, so I've quit predicting <laughs> what my former boss will do. I don't, I, don't I, think so. I, don't, I don't think she will. But I also think she should do whatever she wants to do. She has served in public service in a way that nobody can ever meet, and there's more service for her to give <coughs> in a variety of ways. And as an old friend of mine, whom many people on this panel know, David Wilhelm, in a discussion mm -hmm. about faith one day, we were both 
faith-based voters ourselves. And he said, you know, there are many ways to serve, and you need to be open to that. And I think she's going to find that. She, there's always been a way for her to serve, importantly, and change the quality of people's lives, and I have no less expectation of her now. I don't think she's going to run. And I don't think she should run, and I don't think she could win. Um, I don't expect that, by the way. But, but I, I do think there's a chance, and I think there's a, actually a pretty good chance, that Joe Biden will run. I think John and, Kerry and Bernie Sanders, too, right? And, and Well, and maybe. Um, and I think if Joe Biden did run, Joe Biden is the kind of guy who, you know, I, two years ago or three years ago when he was thinking about running, and I can't even believe this was the case, but the thing that people worried about with Joe Biden was that he would say something that was controversial. <laughs> no, that's all we want. It's like, oh my God, is Joe right. Biden is going to say something. Uncle Joe. And, and then Donald Trump runs and says everything and wins. The bar is so wins. different now. Yeah. The bar is so different now. And speaking of the bar, Joe Biden is one of those Democrats who can go into a bar anywhere yep. in the country and talk to working class voters. Mm. And if you look at why Democrats lost last time, it wasn't because we didn't get a sufficiently high percentage of the vote among the traditional right. liberal constituencies. It was because too many middle class voters abandoned our party. And we're, you know, in my opinion, um, the Democrats will run a risk with, with Bernie Sanders out doing what Bernie Sanders does so well of, of fighting so much um, that, that our nominee is weakened significantly into a general election yeah. unless we can find somehow a unifying candidate. Shut him down. And I think Biden is probably the only person out there who could be that right. unifying you know, candidate. You know what else Biden does? He's a comforter. He's a comforter. He's a comforter. And, and by 2019, in the heat of battle, yes. I, I think people, in addition to the fact that, I don't know about you, but I'm looking for comfort every day right now, just trying to, well, no, I mean that seriously. I have a 13 and a 15 year old. And when I'm sitting there trying to explain to them what's just happened in Las Vegas, I'm looking for comfort. My husband, <coughs> my friends, we talk about it. You know, you think the city's divided. A.B. and I were young mothers on a, we were, we were tried to be young mothers on a block. <laughs> Between the two of us, we had five children that were preschoolers together. We were raising our kids on the same block. And, and I think Joe Biden, um, in a way that Ronald Reagan had as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Ronald Reagan was an optimist, but a comforter. Well, you he's know? in so much and personal I think tragedy. People, yeah, yeah but, I, but I think by 2019, not just the political anxiety that people have lived through. But I think what this country's experienced emotionally could be very compelling and, for a Joe Biden. And to get to the question about youth and energy on the left, it, it, Biden could generate as much or nearly as much as anybody yeah, that the Democrats true. could nominate. But he could really generate it if he said, I'm, I recognize that my age is a, an impediment to many people, so I'm only going to serve one term. And I'm going to pick today as my vice president, Kamala Harris. So we're going to have the first woman president, the first African American woman president, and I'm going to I'm going to train her to be president. You have the bumper during, stickers already printed. I've I know. Wow. Hey, well. Go, Joe. Go, Joe. Go. He, no, but he it bought them for five cents. You're going to pay five bucks if for he, them. If he year. ran, if he ran a ticket and said it was a four-year ticket that you, where you're voting for a guy who's going to be there for four years and somebody who's going to succeed him, you'd bring the energy out on the left. You'd reassure the people in the middle. Interesting. And you'd bring the middle class back. Interesting. That's really Ron? Yeah, I, I yeah. just really, I, I think <laughs> I'll, I'll that, defer to AB first. that the, all, the energy of the youth in this, in 2016, was with Bernie Sanders. And, um, you know, I think that the, I think most Americans uh, think that that's, those are unrealistic policies, um, that he is a self-declared socialist, that our government is broken and, and, and bankrupt, and we can't afford to make promises that everything will be paid for under any circumstances, whether it's college or single-payer health care or anything, it's very easy to run against Bernie. And um, the Russians not, will not, help. Not really. <laughs> well, yeah. well, no, but, <laughs> I said, but the point is, you know, that, that he, I, I think that um, <laughs> Hillary, Hillary was so the establishment uh, um, sort of incumbent um, non-change candidate, so he really actually tapped and sapped the, the young energy. And so it'll really, really be, I, I, I mean, I think Steve's vision is interesting about how to find that person who can get all the different coalitions mm -hmm. and especially the different age groups. But that's a problem going forward if Bernie kind of keeps this up um, mm -hmm. and, and, and keeps is. the young people away from the mainstream, um, maybe not free trade, but not anti-trade, you know, um, business sometimes friendly, uh, you know, 
capitalists in the party. I think that, that that's a real problem that the party's having. And they, they don't have an economic message. White, middle class, working class voters stop listening to them, that, that it always voted Democrat. It's a real crisis turning point for the party. And, and I think that if, if they lose young people permanently to Bernie, who, who disassociate from, um, from politics, that'll be a huge uh, uh, liability for the party. And, and, I'll, and I'll take the, the caveat that was thrown out earlier, the one year sort of unity ticket, let's get the country back together. And I know he's not watching because he's a baseball fan and therefore he wouldn't be watching NYU because he's sitting in Columbus, Ohio. But I'd call it the John's ticket. And I'd look at John Kasich and John Hickenlooper, the governor from Colorado. Mm. Bipartisan. Uh, Democrat. But, yeah. but Great run, guy. Do they run as independents or do they run as Republicans or Democrats or what? I, I don't know. Kasich's been saying a lot in the news in the last couple of days of either he Maybe becomes, leaving the party. Yeah, an independent or he just leaves the party altogether. But when you talk about the enthusiasm, and, and this is where Trump misses it that all of us up here get of you're in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire in a diner talking to constituents, talking to voters, getting to really fine tune your message. If you get someone who has run before, who has that experience before, and Trump just says, I've made America great again, I think you're gonna get a lot of younger people who are more excited to get someone who actually sounds and talks more like them than huge and let me insult social on Twitter. So my prediction is the Johns, it's a, and, and watch very carefully, they're on Meet the Press, they're like frick and frack, I meet the press all the time. And they're, they're both governors. And they're both governors. Here's, and here's, here's the challenge, though. How do you get over the fact that you can't get ballot access in enough states uh, unless you start right now and you have, like... Michael no, Bloomberg. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe Michael Bloomberg's going to pay to put him on yeah, the ballot. Yeah, but, but the reality is the highest performance we've had, you've had of a third-party candidate is still Ross Perot. 19. Right? 19 yeah. percent. And, and how many electoral college votes? And he was hugely votes? popular. And how many electoral college votes? Yeah. I mean, That's the problem. Zero, there, there it would are, be, it, right. It would be it would be wonderful if we if we had a system that would actually enable a serious third party but this to has, participate. But this has happened before with the Whigs, right? Like when the Republican Party, when the Whigs, when the Whigs the collapsed, time, the Republicans grew. So, so there are three place, things yeah. that I encourage all of you to think about as you watch the next 18 months, as people begin to position themselves for what yeah. unorthodox presidential tickets might look like and orthodox presidential tickets might look like. Uh, three things. One is, at the heart of this, is the restoration of faith in government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we believe in our government, right? Because any of these candidates' message is going to have to be attached to what they believe they can make government do for you, OK? So right there, you're swimming uphill, whether you're Republican, Democrat, whether you're Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton running again. You're swimming uphill. Number two, what is the faith in the mainstream media by 2020? The numbers are up under Trump. The numbers are up. Okay. Yeah, they are. Faith but, in the media but, is up the but last this couple is, months. But this is a big deal, right? We have to understand that because it was it the the Trump really ran against the media, not just yeah. the establishment, and he's governing against the media, right? Because okay. he doesn't have and Hillary so, Obama. Anymore. So last right. cycle we talked about what is the media? Oh, it's digital now. Oh, it's you know, you know, I governed at the DNC. I put the Democratic Party on the web for the first time with a website. That's how you know we. We actually, the rise of talk radio under Newt Gingrich after the 94 suite yep. changed the dynamic. But now it's actually, what does that mean? And here's the other thing now. How do we know what the media, what, whoops, oh. sorry about that. How do we know what the media was in the last election to know how it's going to be different? We don't even know yet. We just found out last week it was Facebook and the Russians. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't mean that flippantly. I mean that quite seriously, right? We, so it's hard to analyze. What, as a campaign strategist, somebody like Steve, who's brilliant at this, who I turn to for projects and assignments still because he's the biggest thinker on this, how do you do that when we don't even really understand what happened? Yeah. We don't even know yet. And it's going to take congressional hearings <laughs> to tell us yep. what happened. So it's really, while we talk about the quality of candidates, the policies, the issues, remember, right now you have a country whose faith in government is at an all-time low, whose faith in <coughs> what could arguably be what sets us apart and created our democracy, a free press, paired with free re freedom of religion, we don't, lowest numbers ever. Um, I'm going to take one more question, but I just want to add to Kiki's comments and just say, um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, it's government, and I, I think to me it's more government versus media in a, in a strange way, and that's because 
we're all being disrupted by technology, right? Like that is yep. the big thing that defines us right now is media is being disrupted, government's being disrupted, and technology wants <coughs> to change everything. Everything's faster, and we expect our phones to deliver us the world, right? And 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 so the when we're in the middle of this process, we're only in the beginning of this process right now. Um, but government was not built to move quickly. Our founding fathers, in their wisdom, built this government to be incredibly deliberative and slow moving and checks and balances. And so it was actually viewed, you know, they viewed rapid change akin to tyranny, right? And so um, it, it is built to be resistant to disruption. And so I think that you see these forces of disruption, that to me is the bigger thing, is this disruption of like, you know, and, and, and how it's completely changing media and completely changing government, and who wins the disruption, right? Like, how do you make government more quick? How do you get it to react more quickly without totally breaking it, and it's being broken right now? Well, I'll tell you, and it's, by the way, it's not just this last cycle, but I, I will tell you what my sister said after Katrina, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a political statement on her part on the Gulf Coast. When we finally got to speak, she said to me, how is it that a church from Alabama with a van can get to the parking lot of the washed out Walmart and put a tent up and feed my neighbors chili out of a crock pot and my federal government can't get here to get a roof over their heads, right? Absolutely. That's not blame on any one individual. That's a question where it demonstrates her faith there will in the government will never be what it once was. She's yeah. an intellectual, she's an attorney, she's, you know, she's, a, she's an elite where she lives. Um, but her faith will never be what it once was because of that experience. And now we've got, even under the best of circumstances, to situations. It was, we're totally out of time, but there was one guy back there who was, wanted to ask a question, so I was going to let him ask it. Thank you very much. Um, the UN, just recently, the United States voted against a non-binding resolution to condemn countries that impose capital punishment against GLBT citizens. Do you have any insights as to why our country voted against that with some very dubious partners? I don't. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I, 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 no. I know. I just. <clears throat> no. OK. No. no. Sorry. <laughs> I wish we did. It would make it a lot easier, wouldn't it? I haven't read any backstory. I don't think it's been reported. It's the NFL story. I, so thank you so much to our esteemed panelists for taking the time tonight to come out and talk to us. And I think it was a really fun discussion. So thank, thank you, you all tonight. Thank, thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you.